an evolution of tie up to the Civil War as to where we are today. So it is our pleasure to welcome and receive Sergeant Eugene Wilson. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you for that introduction, Robert. And good evening, Delaney family. Good evening. Good evening. And I trust that everyone is doing well this Juneteenth evening. And from the welcome, or rather from the time that I logged on until a few minutes before the meeting began, I could see that some people were really enjoying them themselves this evening. So that's awesome. <laughs> All right, now, um, as Robert just uh, mentioned, my name is Eugene Wilson. And I'll probably go ahead and repeat a couple of things, but I am from uh, Memphis, Tennessee. I'm the youngest of my parents' four children. And I've been working as a defense contractor uh, for the Army since I retired from the United States Air Force in April of 2004. Uh, prior to that, I was um, serving our nation as an active duty United States Air Force Airman for 21 and a half years. My family and I were stationed in Europe and several continental United States bases, none more significant than my first assignment, which was Myrtle Beach Air Force Base in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Namely because I met the love of my life there my wife now of 37 years and counting, Kathy Hadley Wilson, as Robert just alluded to. Uh, Kathy is one of James, Jack, and Christine Hadley's um, three. She is the first born of their three, and she's also the eldest uh, daughter of their um, children. Uh, Kathy and I, um, we brought three children of our own into this world and we raised them on the North American and European continents over the span of two and a half decades. We parented them in Florida, Nebraska, um, and Oklahoma, and Arizona. Um, finally, we do have a beautiful daughter in love who's married to our youngest uh, son. And at current, none of our children have blessed us with the matchless gift of grands. Um, but there's no pressure on them, you know, but we're, we're just patiently uh, waiting it out. So, um, while I'm not a historian, nor am I a his history scholar, I do serve as the current fundraising chairman on the Jack Hadley Black History Museum board. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do a little shameless plug for the uh, Jack Hadley Black History Museum uh, board and our invaluable uh, volunteers, of which the museum would be hard pressed to operate in the absence of either. So did you guys know that being a historian or a history scholar are not requirements for Jack Hadley Black History uh, Museum board membership or join, joining our highly valued volunteers. What's more is that we're ever on the lookout for people who possess a driven passion for truth telling, delivering an accurate full accounting of America's evolution and growth, however it may appear to the world. If you have the same spirit and or if this message is speaking to you, could it be that Jack Hadley Black History Museum is the place where you would like to serve? If so, you guys can call the Jack Hadley Black History Museum at 229-228-5029. I'll provide the number to uh, Robert and he can provide to the group as well. 
but I just wanted to put that in um, for now. All right, so it is 229, area code 229, 228-5029. All right, are we good? Okay, so um, Robert approached me a while back uh, during a book club meeting that my wife Kathy was running for the museum uh, back in uh, the early part of the year, February through uh, April, first part of April, and asked if I would present uh, some information to the group, and I, and I um, agreed to do that. And so in doing that, Robert kind of gave me the, the lowdown of how things should proceed. And the first thing he said was that you guys would give me an unlimited amount of time, like roughly three to five hours uh, to do a presentation. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I woke up, you know, and he, and he gave me the real, the real deal. So basically, I, I'm probably gonna go right up up, up to the top of the hour, but probably maybe a little bit less of your time tonight. I hope that's okay. Um, is that all right? That's fine. Okay. That's fine. All right. So, as a backdrop for our short time together tonight, I'm going to draw from the highly inspirational book uh, entitled The 1619 Project. And more specifically, we'll be talking from chapter 11. And how I plan to proceed with the evening is um, I'm going to give you guys some information. I'm going to facilitate a little briefing here that's going to last maybe 15, 20 minutes. And it's going to cover information on an overview of Reconstruction, the Black Codes, the Jim Crow Laws, and when we get to the Jim Crow laws, I'm going to do a little spinoff on that. And I'm going to go ahead and get you guys engaged. What I would like to do during, at the conclusion of the Jim Crow section, I would like to have anyone that's um, had a Jim Crow experience. And what I'm looking for, I, I know that the Delaney's are spread out across the United States. So what I would like to see is if someone wouldn't mind sharing an experience that they had with Jim Crow laws or things of that nature that is from the, from the I guess we call it the Deep South. I know you guys have people up in the uh, New York, uh, Illinois area, I believe. So hopefully someone's in that area and someone else that's not in the Deep South area, if you would, just give us a brief um, rendition of your experience with a Jim Crow uh, type law. And, and again, I will kind of coach you through that when we get to that point. But go ahead and start thinking now, because I know that this group is very shy and they don't like to talk. So, um, <laughs> so I'm giving you an opportunity to get ready now. No, I know you guys are very uh, expressive, and I, and I really appreciate that. And then after that, we're going to do a little wrap-up, a summation, and where I'll take some information expressly from the 1619 Project, where it talked about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And then we'll, if we have time, we'll do a short uh, finale uh, with uh, a collaborative Q&A session if you will. All right, I'm gonna stick close to the cuff here so I can get through my information and we will continue on now. So our historical backdrop reference is what we'll cover for right now. The uh, 1619 Project is a journalistic, historical, audio video written endeavor that was coordinated and led by the award-winning investigative journalist, writer, Nicole Hannah-Jones. The project was released in 2019 by the New York Times. 
It reframes U.S. history by putting the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans front and center of the narrative. The project's title refers to the year 1619, which is when the first enslaved Africans were brought to the Virginian English colony, marking the beginning of chattel slavery in the United States. So if anyone's wondering what chattel slavery um, is, brief definition for that is, it's a system which allowed people considered legal property to be bought, sold, and owned forever in a lawful manner, which was supported by the U.S. colonies and the, uh, some of the, um, the European powers from the 16th through the 18th centuries. So, all right. Now, the 1619 Project is comprised of essays, articles, and artistic works exploring various American history aspects and their connections to slavery and its enduring legacy. It reviews such topics as the arrival of enslaved Africans, the role of slavery in American Revolution, the contributions to black Americans, uh, to democracy and culture, racial discrimination effects, and the ongoing struggles for freedom and equality. This work challenges traditional historical narratives often downplayed or overlooked um, the way in which slavery shaped the nation's development. The book highlights the pervasive and systemic nature of racism throughout the American history and argues that understanding this history is crucial for addressing contemporary racial disparities and pursuing a more just and inclusive society. Overall, the 1619 Project has sparked significant public debate and influenced discussions about race, history, and the ongoing struggle for racial justice in the United States. It has also inspired educational initiatives, curriculum development, and further research into the role of slavery in black Americans in shaping American society. Okay, so now let's go ahead and turn to the U.S.'s Reconstruction period. U.S. Reconstruction refers to the era immediately following the American Civil War, which dates from the years 1865 to 1877. It was a significant period of social, political, and economic transformation in the aftermath of the Civil War that aimed to negatively impact the issue of slavery, secession, and rights of newly freed African Americans. The main goal of Reconstruction, <clears throat> the main goals of Reconstruction were to restore Southern states to the Union, establish civil rights for freed slaves, and ensure their political participation. Within this country, the political progress, the, the political process is the engine that delivers on public policy. Without it, some people groups struggle mightily to exist while still others thrive in a magnanimous way. However, the process of reconstruction was complex and faced numerous challenges. Some key aspects of reconstruction were, one, um, the amendments. Uh, three constitutional amendments were ratified during this period. The 13th Amendment in 1865, which abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment in 1868 granted citizenship and equal protection under the law to all individuals born or naturalized in the U.S., 
And the last of those was the 15th Amendment in 1870. This prohibited the denial of voting rights based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Another element um, of Reconstruction was the Freedmen's Bureau. <clears throat> the Freedmen's Bureau was established in 1865 to assist newly emancipated slaves in various aspects of their lives, including education, employment, health care, and land ownership. It played a crucial role in providing aid and support to millions of freed slaves. A third aspect <clears throat> associated with Reconstruction were the Reconstruction Acts. In 1867, the Reconstruction Acts were passed by Congress, which divided the southern states into military districts and required them to draft new conditions, or I'm sorry, required them to draft new constitutions that guaranteed African-American men the right to vote. These acts also mandated the ratification of the 14th Amendment as a condition for re-entry into the Union. A fourth aspect of Reconstruction um, is or was political participation. Reconstruction witnessed the active political engagement of African Americans. Many formerly enslaved individuals registered to vote and African Americans were elected to various political offices at the local, state, and federal levels, including the United States Congress. A fifth um, element of Reconstruction that's common to that era were the Civil Rights Act of 1866. This legislation enacted over President Andrew Johnson's veto. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 affirmed the rights of African Americans as U.S. citizens and provided federal protection against discriminatory state laws known as the Black Codes. All right, so the Black Codes. Has anyone ever heard of the Black Codes? Yeah. Would you care to go ahead and deliver a definition on the Black Codes of what you know about that, sir? Okay, let me, let me go ahead and tack on a little bit more to that. So um, the Black Codes, as the gentleman stated, these were a series of laws that were enacted by the Southern, U United St the Southern U.S. states immediately after the Civil War ended and during the Reconstruction era. They were crafted to hamper formerly enslaved African Americans' basic existence. Black codes restricted the rights and freedom of movement of African Americans and maintained white supremacy despite the abolition of slavery. They varied from state to state, but they shared similar objectives. Some of the more common provisions included things such as labor contracts, um, with labor contracts, black codes often mandated that freed African Americans sign annual labor contracts with white employers. These contracts bound African Americans to work for low wages on plantations or other agricultural jobs. If they, if they refused, the blacks, if they refused to sign or violated the terms, they could be arrested and punished on the spot. Another element of these black codes were curfews and vagrancy laws. 
Black codes imposed curfews on African Americans, restricting their movement and preventing them from gathering after dark. Vagrancy laws were also enacted, which allowed authorities to arrest African Americans for being unemployed or unable to prove employment. This system was used to force freed slaves back into labor on plantations. A third aspect of these black codes, land ownership restrictions. Some black codes prohibited African Americans from owning or leasing land, particularly in urban areas, limiting their economic opportunities and forcing them to work for white land owners. Uh, a fourth element was racial segregation. Black codes enforced racial segregation by mandating separate public facilities such as schools, transportation, and accommodations based on race. This, the Black Codes, set the stage for a later legal establishment of Jim Crow segregation. More on that in, a, in just a minute. And then a fifth and final element of these Black Codes um, was deemed restriction of civil rights. Black codes sought to limit the civil rights of African Americans. They often imposed restriction on their ability to testify against white people in court, serve on juries, or vote in elections. Once again, Black codes were white dominance and controlled the labor force and denied African Americans full rights and liberties promised via Re Reconstruction Amendments. Black codes were part of a broader effort by white Southerners to maintain social and economic order for newly freed African American populations. Along with other forms of discrimination and violence, black codes contributed to the need for further federal intervention during Reconstruction to secure civil rights for African Americans. Additionally, black codes played a major role in pushing the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and subsequent legislation during Reconstruction to protect the rights of freed slaves. All right, so how's my driving so far, you guys? Good, good. All right, so are you ready to move, move forward into our um, Jim Crow laws? All right, here we go. So um, let, me, let me start off by asking another question. Jim Crow. We always refer to Jim Crow, everyone has heard of it, but does anyone know the genesis of the term Jim Crow? Or anyone care to take a stab at it? Go ahead, sir. And I tell you what, you come into the uh, Delaney family uh, Monday night, monthly Monday night meeting, and you, you will run into some historians. That, that was spot on, spot on. That was pretty good. Um, so, yeah, basically, the term Jim Crow, it originated from what was called or termed minstrel show. It was a, a minstrel show character that was popular in the 19th century. Um, U.S. minstrel shows, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, yes, absolutely. So those minstrel shows were a form of entertainment that featured white performers in blackface makeup, portraying exaggerated and derogatory stereotypes of African Americans. 
One of the traditional characters in these shows was a clumsy, ignorant black man named Jim Crow. Jim Crow was created by Thomas Dartmouth Rice, who was also known as T.D. Rice, a white actor who performed in blackface in the early 1830s. T.D. Rice's performance, which included a song and dance routine, became immensely popular and was imitated by other performers. These laws were enacted in the late 19th century and early 20th century in the U.S., primarily in the southern states. So what does that little phraseology mean? Primarily in the southern states. What does that infer? That they were um, black as throughout the nation, but they were primarily in the south. Absolutely. So just because it was happening a whole lot down south doesn't mean that it wasn't going on uh, somewhere else in, in the nation. All right. Excuse me, can I, can I just ask you one thing? Yes. Uh, President Johnson, it, wasn't he the one who really, after the Civil War, because he was, he, he didn't like the, 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 uh, the, the white plantation owners, and if they, when they came to D.C. and they bowed homage to him, and, and he accepted that this was after Lincoln was killed, and he let them put these laws in effect. You know what? That is, that is rock solid. That means you're, you're reading my notes here, but that's okay. Because you are spot on, and, and I, I really appreciate that. And I'm going to cover, cover that little aspect later, but what you just said was, was all true. That was... That was um, Johnson's deal. He decided to go forward with how he wanted to do things after Lincoln was assassinated. And I've got some other stuff that I'm gonna hit, but I, I'm gonna qualify your answer as spot on for right now. Thank you. All right, so the um, Jim Crow laws were enacted, as I said, in the 19th century and 20th uh, century and they were a series of state and local laws that enforced racial segregation and discrimination against African Americans and other non-white individuals. Isn't that something? The Jim Crow era ran from the 1870s to the mid-1960s. That's just like yesterday. 1960s. Um, that's nine decades long, y'all. The Jim Crow laws were to enforce racial segregation and maintain white supremacy by levying legal and social restrictions upon African Americans. The laws were based on the belief in the racial superiority of white people and aimed to separate black and white Americans in nearly every aspect of life, including public facilities, schools, <coughs> excuse me, transportation, housing, and employment. Jim Crow laws mandated the separation of races through a policy known as separate but equal. Separate but equal. However, the reality was far from equal. As the facilities and services provided for African Americans were consistently inferior to those provided for white individuals. Common features of Jim Crow laws, not all inclusive by no means, I'm gonna run through a couple of, a, a few of them here. Number one, segregated public facilities. These laws require the separation of public facilities such as schools, parks, hospitals, restrooms, transportation, and even cemeteries based on race. African Americans were forced to use separate, often poorly maintained and underfunded facilities. 
Number two, racial segregation in housing. Jim Crow laws allow the racial segregation in housing, limited, limiting where African Americans could live and restricting their access to certain properties or neighborhoods. Third, poll taxes and literacy tests. Many Southern states impose poll taxes and literacy tests as a way to disenfranchise African American voters. These requirements disproportionately affected black voters who were often unable to pay the taxes or pass the tests due to educational or limited, I should say, limited educational opportunities and economic disparities. A fourth aspect <clears throat> were anti-miscegenation uh, laws. Jim Crow laws also prohibited interracial marriage and relationships, aiming to maintain racial purity and prevent social integration. At this point, you start to kind of bring into picture in your mind about some of the legal aspects of the country during this period. And one of those major uh, cases that went before the Supreme Court was a Virginia couple, um, the Lovings, the Lovings uh, versus uh, Virginia, which was decided that, uh, back on the 12th of this month in 1966. That was just decided in June 12th in 1966. That's scary close to me. All right, a fifth aspect of Jim Crow laws, discrimination in employment and public accommodations. African-Americans faced discrimination and limited opportunities in employment and were denied access to certain public accommodations such as hotels, restaurants, and theaters. In Thomasville, in Thomasville, Georgia, many of you might know of the Jack Hadley Black History Museum. And you may also know that the Jack Hadley Black History Museum back in 2018 was presented with an opportunity to save one of history's, um, one of the Chitlin Circuit uh, history hotels named the Imperial Hotel, right there on West Jackson Street. And the Imperial Hotel was secured, purchased by the Jack Hadley Black History Museum and is now part of the Jack Hadley Black History Museum, in which case, over the next uh, few years, you will see some things start to come about um, in that area where the, the Jack Hadley, uh, where the Imperial Hotel is located. And the Imperial Hotel was one of those Chitlin Circuit um, hotels where black entertainers who were traveling around the Southeast to certain venues, they would be able to have a rest, but they would be able to stop in at the Imperial Hotel and be able to uh, get a decent night's uh, rest or a period of time to stay at the Imperial Hotel. All right, it's important to note here that the Jim Crow laws were challenged by civil rights activists and organizations throughout their existence. The legal foundation of segreg segregation was eventually dismantled through various court cases most notably the landmark Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, which declared racial segregation in public schools um, unconstitutional. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s ultimately led to the abolishment of Jim Crow laws with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. These laws prohibited racial segregation, uh, discrimination, and protected the voting rights 
of African Americans. Now, at this time, I'm going to pause and what I would like to is have a couple of individuals, maybe someone from what we would call the, the Deep South and someone from uh, north of, let's say, Tennessee and, and uh, Maryland, if, if you would, to go ahead and just give us an experience of how you might have come about to the realization that there were Jim Crow laws. And, and in doing this, what I, I'm going to give you some guidelines. What I want you to do is tell us the conditions or the circumstances uh, surrounding that experience, like what part of the country you are or were in the approximate year. Tell us what happened specifically. And then, you know, how did that make you feel? And if that situation was addressed or what you would do um, to have it resolved. Are there, do I have any volunteers that would like to do that? To, to give us a Jim Crow experience? Uh, could it be to have the us? Because I like to say, like my dad. That's fine. World War II. Okay. And he was from Thomas, he was a Delaney, and he was from Thomas, from Georgia. His name was William Delaney Sr. And he, uh, he was, when he went into the military, and my uncle, uh, Perry Delaney, his brother, when they were senior, when he went in, they went into the military, they were playing with Cambridge. And, um, I, I mean, they really didn't talk that much of, about it, but it was there. They were proud to wear the uniform, but they, they felt it. And, uh, to uncle. Okay. Okay, and so, I know how that was been humiliating, you know, to, to, uh, fight for a country and then still be segregated. My uncle was one of the first black Marines. Uh, he trained at uh, Montford Point. The white drill instructors, they turned over in that grave when they saw those black guys in a Marine uniform. Mm. Uh, Joe can uh, probably talk about the Marines. Uh, but my uncle was one of the, one of the first they were sent to the South Pacific, and uh, they they were fired their weapons. They just sat there and watched things go by. So that's a prime example of how Jim Crow was in the military until it was fully integrated by Truman later on. All right. Any others? Do, we we got time for for, for one more. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, military related. It could just be in um, any aspect of of life. Well, I, you know what, all I know, being from New York, when I went to the South with my grandmother, and I had to sit, and uh, you know, living in New York, and having the freedom I thought, that I would go to the South and South to the South of Georgia, and I had to sit in and when we went to South Blue the land and the train as a child, I just I'll never forget it. It was two thousand in the in the in the in the waiting room. One said white water and one said color. And I couldn't understand why this water was this way as a child. I felt like oh, what the color of water? I was so confused. And my grandmother had to explain I had Wow. Wow. I mean, thank you to all who shared this evening. And I'm sure everyone probably has something that they've had, maybe a similar experience or something else that was a derivative of this Jim Crow era that we've had to uh, experience. But um, 
true to form, African Americans, black, blacks in this country are resilient. We are a resilient people and we carry on and we press forward. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and, and move forward and thank you again for, to those who share. I'm gonna do a little <clears throat> 1619 project wrap up um, with some information that kind of goes on to tell in the Civil War and Reconstruction era uh, from the 1619 project. The period following the Civil War was one of economic terror and wealth stripping that has left black people at lasting economic disadvantage. White Americans have seven times the wealth of black Americans on average, though black people make up nearly 13% of the United States uh, population, they hold less than 3% of the nation's total wealth. The median family wealth for whites is $171,000 compared with just $17,600 for blacks. They have almost 10 times um, the wealth of, of blacks. It is worse on the margins. According to the Economic Policy Institute, 19% of black households have zero or negative net worth. Just 9% of white families are that poor. Today's racial wealth gap is perhaps the most glaring legacy of American slavery and the violent economic dispossession that followed. The fate suffered by Elmore Bowling um, and his family was not unique to them or to Jim Crow Alabama. Elmore Bowling was basically a one-man economy in Loudonsboro, Alabama. And Elmore Bowling was a man who made himself into a economic powerhouse for the times. Um, he was very business-oriented and was able to uh, go from rags to riches, so to speak. Um, so, and, and you can learn more about him in the uh, 1619 Project. It was part of a much broader social and uh, political campaign. When legal slavery ended in 1865, there was great hope for, for formerly enslaved people. Between 1865 and 1870, the Reconstruction um, established birthright citizenship, making all black citizens and granting them equal protection under the law and gave black men the right to vote. There was also the promise of compensation. In January um, 1865, General William Sherman issued an order reallocating hundreds of thousands of acres of white-owned land along the coasts of Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina for uh, settlement by black families in 40-acre plots. You guys have all heard of 40 acres and a mule. Congress established the Freedmen's Bureau to oversee the transition from slavery to freedom and the Freedmen Savings Bank was formed to help four million formerly enslaved people gain financial freedom. When Lincoln was assassinated, and here's where we have some information earlier that one of the family members brought about uh, President Johnson, or rather, when Lincoln was assassinated, Vice President Andrew Johnson effectively rescinded Sherman's order by pardoning white plantation owners and returning to them the land on which 40,000 or so black families had settled. This is a country for white men, and by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men, Johnson declared in 1866. The Freedmen's Bureau, always meant to be temporary, was dismantled in 1872, <clears throat> more than 60,000 black people deposited more than $1 million into the Freedmen's Savings Bank, but its all-white trustees 
began issuing speculative loans to white investors and corporations, and when it failed in 1874, many black depositors lost much of their savings. The origins of the racial wealth gap started within the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with the land grants of 40 acres, says William Darity Jr., a professor of public policy and American, uh, African American studies at Duke University. Any financial progress that black people made was regarded as an affront to white supremacy. After a decade of black gains under reconstruction, a much longer period of racial violence would wipe nearly all of it away. To assuage Southern white people, the federal government pulled out the Union troops who were stationed in the South to keep order. During this period of so-called redemption, lawmakers throughout the South enacted black codes and Jim Crow laws that stripped blacks of many of their freedoms and property. Other white people, often aided by law enforcement, waged a campaign of violence against black people that would rob them of an incalculable amount of wealth. Armed white people stormed prosperous majority black Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 to murder do dozens of black people, forced 2,000 others off their property and overthrow the city uh, government. In the red summer of 1919, at least 240 black people were murdered across the country. And in 1921, in one of the bloodiest racial attacks in U.S. history, Greenwood, a prosperous black neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was burned and looted. It is estimated that as many as 300 black people were murdered and 10,000 were rendered homeless. Some estimates were higher than that on the murder. 35 square blocks were destroyed. No one, not one, was ever convicted in any of these acts of racist violence. You have limited opportunity to accumulate wealth, and then you have a process where that wealth is destroyed or taken away, Darity says. And all of us, and all of that is prior to the effects of restrictive covenants redlining the discriminatory application of the GI Bill and other federal programs. The post-reconstruction plundering of black wealth was not just a product of spontaneous violence, but etched into law and public policy. Through the first half of the 20th century, the federal government actively excluded black people from government wealth building programs. In the 1930s, President Franklin Roosevelt, um, his New Deal helped build a solid middle class through sweeping social programs, including Social Security and the minimum wage. But a majority of black people at the time were agricultural laborers or domestic workers, occupations that were ineligible for these benefits. The establishment of the Home Owners Loan Corporation in 1933 helped save the collapsing housing market, but it largely excluded black neighborhoods from government issued loans. Those neighborhoods were deemed hazardous and colored in red on maps, a practice that came to be known as redlining. The GI Bill is often hailed as one of Roosevelt's most enduring legacies. It helped usher millions of working class veterans uh, through college and into new homes and the middle class. But it discriminated, it discriminatorily benefited white people. While the bill didn't explicitly exclude black veterans, the way it was administered often did. The bill gave veterans access to mortgages with no down payments, but the Veterans, the Veterans Administration 
adopted the same racially restrictive policies as the Federal Housing Administration, which guaranteed bank loans only to developers who would not sell to blacks. The major way in which people have an opportunity to accumulate wealth is contingent on the wealth positions of their parents and their grandparents, Darity says. To the extent that blacks have the capacity to accumulate wealth, we have not had the ability to transfer the same kinds of resources across generations. And, and now, ladies and gentlemen, as I am um, coming to a close, I, I would just like to say um, thank you to each and every one for not only your attention, but your en engaged participation in this effort tonight. It really made my time spent with um, you all enjoyable. And, you know, I, I might mention that I am an early to bed, early to rise kind of person, but man, this was worth staying up for and, and sharing with you guys. And, <laughs> Um, uh, Robert Hadley, thank you again for inviting me to this. And I, I have to say this, this is one of the most unique things that I have ever seen in my adult life where a group of family members get on the phone once a month and do what you guys do. I think that is highly commendable and uh, and I'm just glad to be able to participate and be a part of it tonight. Um, so thank you all once again for your time. I, I know I kind of went on long, um, but we can have a short collaborative uh, question and answer session if you guys would like to right now. If Are there any questions or any comments or any things that you would like to bring out from the information passed tonight? Yes, the 1619 Project, yes. Okay, um, so I am joined here by my 37-year uh, wedded wife here, and she's the one that actually ran that uh, book club, the 1619 Project, and so Kathy is here, and she's going to go ahead and, and take that question. Hi. Hi, this is Kathy. I'm just going to say it really quickly. Um, we had apartheid here. We just don't call it apartheid, but it was basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's my answer. Okay, even though, okay, even though we didn't have the identification. Okay, thank you. Nelson, Nelson, Nelson Mandela uh, said the difference between.
between the United States and, and South Africa is that America had a document that gave the illusion of inclusivity. Of but course. It, they, had, they had that. He said in South Africa, they had nothing that even talked about equality and justice. Okay. 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 And, okay. What we're going to do is we're definitely going to ask you to come back uh, later on, maybe this year, if not this year, definitely beginning of next year, but we're going to ask you to, to come back. And we like that up your um, pitch about Jack Hadley. I've been to the museum um, several times and I, it's really, really wonderful. And hopefully when we have our family reunion next year, we'll be able to do that and also see the hotel that you were talking about. That was um, the Imperial Hotel. Yes, that is, um, that's going to be renovated. We're in the process of renovating okay. it. Okay. As well. Okay. Okay, is there anyone else that would like to have anything before we... Um, I can't thank you enough. I think that was one. I'm a history buff, so we could talk all night long. So I thought it was really, really great. Well, thank you. Really great. It was. Thank you. It was really good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very, very informative. Very informative. Um, Thanks for coming. That was a great presentation. Thanks. Yes, yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And, uh, if there's nothing else we'd like to talk about, then we'd like to let Edward give us a closing prayer. And wish everybody a happy, happy summer. Thanks, nice presentation. We thank you that our history is being told and taught so that we can know the road that we have walked. We pray that you would continue to allow us to know more about the journey that we have been on so that we will not get weary in well-doing. We thank you for this family, and we thank you for the rich history that we bring to the table. It is a history of overcoming. It is a history of achieving in the midst of great odds. Mm -hmm. It is the history of not failing even when we've gotten knocked down. Mm -hmm. It is the history of getting back up and persisting even in difficult and dangerous times. May that spirit continue to flow in our bloodstream and may it come to the point where we will share our rich and varied history with our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren so that they can know that they can make it with your help, even in the darkest days and in the most difficult situations, because you are a God who never fails. Now, we thank you for the men in this family in a special way. We thank you that they have been not creators of life alone, but there have been fathers who have helped to shape the lives that they helped create. We thank you for the men in this family who have stood tall, even in difficult times. And those who have exhibited a strong faith, even in the midst of life's trials and tribulations. And we thank you that you have bound us together and that you are allowing us to continue to be together. The ancestors are smiling. Those who have gone on before, who have paved the way for us, are proud of what is happening. But may we now stand on their shoulders and then lift the next generation so that they can stand taller, reach higher, and achieve greater things than we have been able to do. Now, protect us during the summer. May we have a summer of joy and happiness and rest and peace and the opportunity to do some of the things that we enjoy doing. Protect us from seen and unseen hurt, harm, and danger. We pray for those who are sick among us. Keep them in your hollow of your hand. And then when you allow us to come back together in September, we pray that your spirit will fall fresh on us and that we might continue the work that is laid before us 
so that we will continue the progress that has been made in all these generations. Thank you for Gene. Thank you for Perita in a special way who had a vision of possibilities and then worked to make those possibilities come to life. And we thank you for the work that the committee will do this summer. And we pray that we will pray for them so that they will have strength, wisdom, and knowledge, and a vision that will empower us to be better in the future than we've been in the past. And we pray this prayer in the matchless, marvelous name of your darling son and our resurrected Lord and Savior, your curly-headed, bronze-skinned son who died that we might have life everlasting, and then rose up with all power in his hand, that we might be able to achieve all that you have planned for us to achieve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, family. Good night, family. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.